Lord Jesus, I pray you bless your word today as we study it. We thank you for your living word that cuts through our bone and marrow and flesh and discerns the thoughts of our heart. And we thank you for your word. And I pray that it will make a difference today in people's hearts and draw us closer to your son, Jesus, Lord. And give us wisdom to understand what we're about to hear in the almighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Ecclesiastes. King Solomon wrote this book. That was the son of David for you those that might not know that. King Solomon penned the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament and was said to be the wisest man that ever lived. Since God offered to give him a wish and he chose wisdom to rule his people, instead of asking for wealth and power, God was very pleased and gave him an abundance of wisdom and more wealth than any king before him. Now I pray God would speak in heavenly wisdom into our lives through his word for us today in the almighty name of Jesus. Verse 1, Ecclesiastes. These are the words of the preacher, King David's son, Solomon. Can also be translated teacher. He ruled in Jerusalem. Verse 2, everything is meaningless, says the preacher. Completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Now, uh, a similar thing, Psalm 39.6 says, Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, keeping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. So it reminds me of the old saying that says that we can't take our wealth with us when we die. And no matter how rich we are, we're still going to die no matter how much money we have that can't save us from death. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 4. Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. Verse 6. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Verse 9. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. There is nothing truly new. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Verse 10. Sometimes people say, here is something new. But actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. Verse 11. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. Verse 12. I, the preacher, was king of Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. Verse 16. I said to myself, Look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all of this is like chasing the wind. Verse 18. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. Now, I also believe that the more the more wealth we have does not bring um, happiness, more happiness, but it can bring more sorrow. In Proverbs 11:28, it says, "He that trusts trusts in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch." I believe that our life is like chasing the wind if we're not living it out in the plan God has for each of our lives. If God has a purpose and plan for us, and we are going against it. What is the purpose of our life, and how can we have a purpose? If we evolve from goo to you, how, how is life going to be precious? Now we teach kids in school we evolve from animals, and we're like animals, so why are we surprised when they often act and behave like animals, bringing guns to school and shooting people? People just abort inconvenient babies after unprotected sex because they are taught that it's their right to choose death for them since it's their body. It is no wonder that life is not any more held to be precious or to have purpose. But if we believe in God's word, it says in Philippians 4, 12 through 13, it says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now the reverse is also true in the Bible. It says in John 15, 5, uh, the book of John, 
says, I, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Now this tells me there is no power, purpose, or plan in our lives apart from Christ. And our life is still futile, like chasing the wind, if we're not with him. In chapter 2, Solomon tells us about how he looked for contentment and pleasure. Building huge houses and buildings, amassing huge amounts of gold and silver, and comparing wisdom to foolishness. He then realizes pleasure in good food, drink, and hard work, but also learns that these things also come from the hand of God. Now we're back in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. It says in 24, So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. Amen. Verse 25, Who can eat or enjoy anything apart from Him? God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who please Him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please Him. Now this too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Then in chapter 3, verse 14, he says, I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that we should fear Him. Well, then Solomon does regress with the worldly view, which gives a depressing conclusion in verses 18 to 22. It says in verse 18, I also thought about the human condition, he said, how God proves that people are like animals. Verse 19, For people and animals share the same fate. Both breathe and both must die. So people have no real advantage over the animals. How meaningless. Both go to the same place. They came from dust and they return to dust. For who can prove that the human spirit goes up when the spirit of animals go down into the earth? Verse 22. So I saw there's nothing better for people to be happy in their work. That is why we are here. Okay, you got to remember, this is before Christ came. He doesn't know yet. No one will bring us back from death to enjoy life after we die. Now you see how futile life sounds without our hope in the resurrection of Christ? This was before the hope Jesus brought to the earth by dying so that we could live. Now Solomon says something profound in chapter 6. Ecclesiastes 6 verse 9 it says, Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about the nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. This is important to God or the Ten Commandments would not have included thou shalt not covet. Amen? Okay, in chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes 15 through 20 it says, Solomon notices our human limits. Verse 15, he says, I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise, he says. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Verse 18, pay attention to these instructions for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. One wise person is stronger than ten leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. This is why Jesus came, because only a spotless offering can be accepted by God for the payment for sin. Now we're going to go to chapter 8 in Ecclesiastes. Verse 17, Solomon says, I realize that no one can discover everything God is doing under the sun. Not even the wisest people will discover everything, no matter what they claim. But if we have faith in what he's doing, we will believe Romans 8.28, Romans 8, it says, And we know that God causes everything to work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Romans 8.28 Now, Solomon sums things up in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 1. It says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, Life is not pleasant anymore. Verse 2. Remember Him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes, and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Verse 3. Remember Him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble, and before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember Him before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding. And before your eyes, the women looking through the windows see dimly. Verse 4. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first tripping of the birds. 
but all then their sounds will grow faint. Verse 5, remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets. Before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom, and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper, and the caper berry no longer inspires sexual desire. What? Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, where the mourners will weep at your funeral. Verse 6, yes, remember your creator now while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait till the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. Verse 7, for then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So I believe God is saying to come to him while he is calling now. In 2 Corinthians 6.2 it says, For God says, At just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Now he concludes in verse 8. Everything is meaningless, says the preacher. Completely meaningless. Keep this in mind. The preacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The preacher sought to find just the right words to express truth clearly. Verse 11. The words of the wise are like cattle prods. They're painful, but they're helpful. Their collected sayings are like nail studded stick which a shepherd drives the sheep. Notice Solomon says painful but helpful. If we are looking for a pastor to tell us what we want to hear, it won't be painful, but worst of all, it won't be helpful. Amen? Amen. So you don't want to go to a feel-good church. You want something that will prick you in the goats. Something that will straighten you out. Verse 12, he says, But my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful. For writing books is endless and much study wears you out. Verse 13, that's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Solomon says, fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. If we are saved, though, the only judgment promised will be how much to reward us on the things we did for the glory of Christ since he paid for any sin we could ever commit by suffering on the cross. And I'm going to pray. If anyone doesn't know Jesus, all you have to do is repent, turn, turn from your sin from to him, and you will be guaranteed a ticket to heaven. But we have to abide in him. We have to do our best not to sin. We're going to never be sinless, but we can sin less often. All you have to do is repent, give your life to Christ. For those of you that know Jesus, I'm just going to ask him to fill you now with the Spirit so you can go out and do what we're doing. Share it, because he's coming soon. You heard the news update. The world's falling apart, but we can have hope in Christ. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your message, your living word today. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross, being in the ground three days, coming back up, showing us that we're going to be res resurrected too when you come back. We know you're coming soon. All we have to do is look at the news. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what falls apart around us, that you're the rock that we stand. Everything else is seeking sound, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor and the power and the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.